no fault of theirs, they are born with the HIV virus. As innocent as these children are, the sad reality is their entire life on earth will be to live with the virus. Unfortunately, most of these children lose their parents right after birth and to make matters worse, they are often neglected by the family members of their dead parents upon knowing their HIV status. This is where the woes of these innocent children begin. In putting this report together, I had to search through some parts of the city and rural Ghana before coming into contact with some of these children living with HIV. My mission was to know more about these orphaned children and came across Augustina Ampofo, an 18-year-old living with HIV. In my interaction with her, she revealed that she got infected with a virus during childbirth. As a result, she was abandoned by her own mother at the hospital until she was finally taken to an orphanage where she has lived her entire life. She tells her story. I was told when I was 15 years. Initially, I was taking the drugs and also, but I didn't know. The reason why I was taking the drugs, so when I was 15 years, that's when I was told that this is the reason why you've been taking these drugs every day. I grilled Augustina on her knowledge of HIV and AIDS. Her answers were a clear indication that she is intelligent and well informed of the virus. When you say you're HIV positive, it means that you have the virus living in you. But when you say you are somebody is living with AIDS, it means the person has by gone past the HIV stage and now the person is in the A stage. The A stage is very dangerous because at that time you can acquire so many diseases. There's something we call drug resistant stage. When you get to that stage, even if they give you paracetamol, any drug they give you, it won't work because the virus has overcome the immune system. It was not until she turned 15 years old when her HIV status was disclosed to her. According to her, it was a difficult moment, one of confusion, anguish and anxiety over unknown future. What made you cry? <laughs> I don't even know, but it's like the news was just broke like that. You are HIV positive. So I didn't see myself to be somebody who believing with the virus, even though I was taking the drugs. And before that, it came to a time, questions were coming into my mind. Why do I keep on taking the drugs? So the day I was told, I was, I was like, so all this was, I was HIV positive. Augustina took me through the various phases of the disclosure of her HIV status. Before I got to 15, at some time, there were some empowerment programs where we were taught about HIV and other um, sexually transmitted infections. So I had a little knowledge about HIV. My knowledge on HIV was a bit high. So the day I was told, even though I felt bad, but because of the empowerment I had already, I realized that it doesn't mean anything. It's not a death sentence. There is more opportunities in life. It is interesting how she has been discreet about her HIV status all these years. Even with her condition, she has defied all odds and has made some headway with her education. Augustina is now a level 200 student in one of the universities in Ghana. She goes about her normal duties with colleagues and has kept her HIV status close to her chest. Augustina has not revealed her status to any of her colleagues due to the stigma attached to persons living with HIV and AIDS in Ghana. How have you been able to keep your status away from people? One key thing is I take off myself so I don't fall sick often. I take off my physical being, my, my health is my priority. I make sure I take my drugs very well so that you wouldn't be looking at me and today I'm sick, tomorrow I'm sick, then some questions begin to come into your mind. And aside that, whenever it's time for me to take my antiviral, I go to a private place. 
when nobody sees me. So once I'm healthy like any of them on campus and I, I hide to take my drugs, there is no way you, you, you have anything to suspect about me. Relying on medicines and supplements to make her keep strong and healthy for 18 years has been very stressful for her. Would you say you are used to the medicine? Um, I would say yes, but the reason I'm saying but is because sometimes when you go to a hospital and you don't get the ones that you are taking, they normally say there is a, a shortage. So when they give you a different one, it takes some time for your system to adjust to it. During the first period of the drug intake, um, you have side effects, you'll be feeling dizzy, some people even eat more often. But as time goes on, your body gets used to the drug, so you wouldn't feel any of those things again. Listening to Augustina, it was obvious that she has grown to be a self-empowered and a wonder lady of her time. With her dream of becoming a French translator and lecturer in future, giving up is not an option. Give me a sentence in French. <laughs> je m'appelle Augustina Ampofo. Je suis 18 ans et je suis étudiante à l'Institut Hollande de Ghana. She has some fears. The fear is about getting someone who will understand you, who will know more about HIV. The way stigma is around, you, it, it's difficult for you to get someone who is ready to spend the rest of your life with you, knowing very well that you being together, it puts the person at risk. I know sometimes when you're going for a job, you do some medicals and the test for HIV without your notice. So my only fear is what, uh, what if I also go to apply for a job and my medicals is being asked of. They take my blood sample and they test that um, and not really. They test and they, the test shows that I'm positive. It means that they are not ready to accept me. They, they only accept me when the person understands it that HIV is not a death sentence. It's, it's not um, transmittable once the individual protects him or herself. So that's my biggest fear. Brian a champion, on the other hand, has also lived with HIV for the past 15 years. Just like Augustina, Brian was brought to the orphanage when he was just one month old. His caregiver has been his guardian angel for all these years. In education, in medical support, in about where I will sleep and how I will play with other people. He has made all things possible for me. And I pray that may the good Lord bless him and let all his hard desires come to pass. He lived in the dark for 12 years, not knowing he was HIV positive. He also didn't know that all the children at the orphanage were HIV positive. His status was finally disclosed to him three years ago. He tells me those moments were times of extreme difficulty. When I was 12 years, and my father told me that I'm positive. I was very sad. I didn't eat for three days. Until my father sat me down and told me about his story before I became okay. Brian says it is a lot of work living on medicines every day. He would be the happiest child if the routine of daily medicines to survive was over, but unfortunately, his very survival on earth depends on the medication. Sometimes even I stop taking the medicine and I'll, I'll get ill. And my father will send me to the hospital to go and do a, a blood test. And they will check and they will say, the virus is high, so I have to take the medicine. But sometimes too, if I take it, I'll be feeling dizzy. So sometimes I will stop and I will start again. And it causes a problem. And the doctor talked to me and I stopped that. Thing. Just like Augustina, Brian has been able to keep his HIV status a secret for fear of stigmatization. He says it is born out of a bizarre experience where his status was leaked years ago by his teacher. 
my father told one of the teachers and the teacher spread it to the other teachers and they started stigmatizing uh, those who are like me and one of my brother we, we were in the school so they started st stigmatizing us and our father put stop to it so we stopped that school and we went to another school Brian Echampon is a JHS leaver awaiting results and placement into one of the senior high schools in the city. He dreams of becoming a doctor in future, but fear of the unknown haunts him every day. Most of the job, you have to do tests before they will take you. So I'm afraid whether if I go and do the test and they say I'm positive, they will prevent me from doing the job. Brian also dreams of becoming a caregiver to other children living with HIV. I want to make a big offering than the way my father has to do. to make big ones so that I can bring more positive ones so that I can also train them like the way my father is doing. As orphans living with HIV, Augustina and Brian recounts the painful truth of not knowing their biological parents and siblings. I feel very bad because I don't even know whether I have a twin sister or a brother. So I feel very bad and sad. Every day I'll be crying. And I want to have a family where I can see my own brother my sister and my mother and my father. Sometimes I feel less disappointed in my like that I don't need anybody and nobody who has come to say you are this but I feel happy that there are so many people out there who don't even get it as I've gotten it. So I feel happy and I comfort myself. There is hope. Once I'm alive there is hope. After hearing the story of Augustina and Brian, I set off to find their caregiver. I met with Reverend John Azuma, who is a pastor and an HIV heart-to-heart -heart campaign ambassador. He has been taking care of children living with HIV for the past 13 years. He started the home for orphaned children living with HIV with his wife. Mrs. Azuma, who is now deceased. This is his story. When we were first diagnosed at the Magena Hospital, it came with a lot of stigma. I was sacked from my church because I'm HIV positive. My children uh, cannot buy food stuff. People believe even there is AIDS in the money. Uh, a lot of issues happen. And uh, finally, even sacked from home, from a rented place. This is the pressure from the other tenants to the landlord is that me and my wife and my children are living with HIV, so he should sack us. And we have been sacked. So it has been very tough, but the Lord has been good. After we got the antiretroviral and we took it and we are strong, together with my late wife, we decided that no, there are too much false rumors about HIV in our community. So let's come out publicly to use ourselves as an example to educate the public. So through the story sharing, then the home was born. Reverend Azuma has 58 children living with HIV under his care. He said taking care of children living with HIV requires some expertise to cater for their needs without a hitch. He explains how these children are recruited. They all came through different, different means, some through social welfare, because they got to know that that is the area I, the, the, uh, the area of focus. Community members bring them, churches bring them, family members also bring them. So they all come through different angles. He said disclosing the status of children living with HIV to them is quite delicate and requires some tact. For him, the disclosure means applying wisdom and in-depth education and counseling. And disclosure in HIV is very important where you tell your partner or your sister or your family of your status. And in the area of children, it's a different ball altogether. So some are taking medicines, but they don't know what kind of medicines they are taking. Yes, because one, they are too young to be told. He doesn't understand anything about HIV. <laughs> so we'll be surprised that you could even go to school and tell the friends that, hey, my daddy say, 
I am HIV. And you see, you know the trouble that it will bring. Reverend Azuma is unhappy about how people living with HIV and AIDS, especially children, are stigmatized. He believes that the stigma associated with persons living with HIV and AIDS is deadlier than the virus. HIV have a very bad psychological effect on the person living with the virus, and especially on children. So I will urge the community that let's show love, let's show we care, let's show acceptance to persons living with HIV, especially children. Imagine you are an orphan and living with HIV. How will you feel like? How will it be like for you? So their psychological aspect is a very bad one and we need to rather encourage. So over here, it's a, it's a home. We, we blend everything together. He admitted that the daily medications are draining on the children, and so he has adopted a creative way of administering the medicines to these children. Most children here, what we can remember is, we don't even say medicine. We have our own names for it. We don't do, look at it, medicine, medicine, in quote. No, we have a different things. Candy, it's time to take my candy. So we all know what our candy is. Our, for us, our candy is the medicine. It's a lifetime medicine. So definitely there'll be fatigue here and there. And you see in general, whether you are HIV or not, you are HIV, taking medicine is not easy. And in this case, now you are in the shoe that you must take it. Yeah, children all over the world get tired. He says having an orphanage for children living with HIV was not part of his plan, but as fate will have it, he is now a father figure to many children. He feeds, clothes, and educates all the 58 children living with this condition under his care without any assistance from government. I never dreamed to bring these children together. It is out of the campaign and the pressure on me and the, and the community that people are calling you every day for a child and I, what can I do? And, and as a man of God is to accept them. Now accepting them is one. Feeding and taking care of them is also another. But the Lord has been good. The National AIDS Control Program, NACP, is the technical lead agency in the health sector's response to HIV and AIDS in Ghana. Its mandate is to deliver the package of services to prevent new HIV infections, provide comprehensive package for HIV treatment, care and support services for role, and generate strategic information for decision making, planning and policy implementation of HIV infections. So, the question is, how has NACP contributed to the welfare of children living with HIV? Gone were the days where everybody felt that once the mother is positive, then the baby is automatically positive. So, there were a lot of cases of people being abandoned babies because the mothers had assumed out of ignorance that their babies were automatically positive. We needed to improve the education on this for people to stop that. That was the first thing we did, we did. The second thing was to intervene at different levels so that even if you are a baby born to a positive mother, your risk of getting the infection is minimized significantly. So we introduced what we call the prevention of mother to child transmission services. The whole idea is that we want to make sure that the baby who can easily get the HIV from the mother, who is innocent, okay, is the mother who got it, is safe. Statistics from the National AIDS Control Program show that about 346,000 people are living with HIV. 13% of the figure are children. This means currently there are 44,980 children living with HIV in Ghana. If we take the now people who were suppressed, as of 2020, um, 3,455 children were suppressed, while adults 65,636. 
as you calculate you notice that the children adults around 95 children you know five percent a little sometimes lower the challenge with healthcare delivery also is that you find more people taking care of adults than children and people see child care as a specialist care and then you have only few uh, pediatricians in ghana also so that is also statistics we need to pay attention to that the NACP says currently there are 19,000 new infections for HIV annually and out of this number, 5,200 new infections occurred in children. With regards to mother-to-child transmission, about 7% of infections occur through breastfeeding. We calculate at 6 weeks and then we calculate at 18 months. By 18 months, the baby would have been exposed to breast milk. It's about double the seven percent I'm talking about. And it's because of breastfeeding. Because some of the babies breastfeed, as they breastfeed over time, they will get the virus. But the question is, then why don't we prevent breastfeeding? We understand that breastfeeding can transmit. But if you take the value of breast milk, compared to formula feed, we encourage them to breastfeed because we are giving them prophylaxis as well. Prophylaxis it reduces the viral um, you know, load in the breast milk. If a new mother opts to give formula feed, which means that the mother doesn't want the baby to be exposed at all, we allow that, but under some conditions. We must be sure that this mother understands. Number two, this mother can afford the formula because you need about less, not less than 66 cans of nan one. Most of them will say we will do it. Somewhere along the line, because of money, they stop. Then they do mixed feeding. Mixed feeding is when you are giving formula and you are giving breast milk. The baby is at a higher risk. The Ghana AIDS Commission says 10 innocent children get infected with HIV every day, a situation the commission is unhappy about. HIV still remains a public health threat in Ghana and um, people are still getting infected but yeah, people are not really reducing risks and taking precautions as they should and it's so alarming that uh, in 2020 alone, over a one-year period, more than 18,928 people got newly infected with HIV. Mother-to-child transmission accounted for more than 3,683 of these new infections. This translates to about 10 new infections in children 0 to 14 years every day. Health experts say children living with HIV are usually faced with psychosocial problems. This, if not properly managed, will have dire consequences on the lives of these children. Adherence counseling is very important because you're going to take this drug for almost your entire life. So that is critical. Some people get tired, they, oh, I've finished delivering. I don't feel sick. Why should I always be taking this medication? And some of them have some little, little uncomfortable effects that you, you have to live with. But at the end of the day, the benefits that you get overshadows this little, little discomfort, if I should use the word, that, that you, you encounter. Taking medicine is not easy. If you're an adult and you are taking even HIV medication for life, it's not the same as starting from a child. And then now when they go to school, we were losing a lot of them. Once they start school, now how to take the medicine so that nobody sees them. They go and hide the medicine in cars, in broken down vehicles. They take it at some odd times. Even if they have to come for I mean, their medication regularly, it means they have to seek uh, exit. Disclosing this to the um, house mistress and all that are big, big psychosocial challenges. The issue of disclosure is critical when it comes to children living with HIV. Both doctors and psychologists have opined that the disclosure must be done under good supervision and guidance 
due to the psychosocial issues and the ignorance on the part of the children. Before you start the disclosure, first you yourself, you need to make background check on HIV. You yourself need to be equipped with HIV, know everything about HIV. After that, you build rapport with the child. If the child doesn't become your friend, it will be very difficult for you to announce it to the child. So you build rapport. Then you explore. Ask the child what he or she knows about HIV. Let him talk a lot. After you know that this is the right time for you to disclose it, then you announce it to the child. And after the announcement, be prepared because normally when news are not properly broken, it leads to mistrust, it leads to anger and even fear. It should be done in a very organized way, systematic way. Because of the psychosocial problems and the ignorance on their part, they could easily commit suicide and all that. You need to do it gradually. The first attempt is around seven years, but it depends on how smart the child is. If you think that the child does not have the capability based on your emotional assessment of the child, you don't start at seven. But we, you need to start somewhere along the line, that is why. And in the, in the disclosure, we have to involve the parent also, health care giver and the parent. Because if you do it, you disclose to the child and the mother doesn't know, she'll go back, there'll be conflict. Health officials believe early disclosure is key to building the confidence of the child. When a, a child becomes very active, when it comes to its reproductive development, you know, some of this information must be known to the child. Or when the child is capable of expressing his or her opinion on matters and have a full understanding to appreciate certain information, the child must be uh, informed about the state. It's, it's something that is very important because it gives information to the child. It makes the child aware of his or her status. Then it is even on the basis of that that will be able to build the confidence of the child. There are a lot of people in uh, other countries, you go to Malawi, you go to South Africa, Zimbabwe, a lot of children are living in HIV, but you, you can't, nobody can come and say that because you are living in HIV, uh, this is where you have to be. But they interact with each other, and the health system has taken care of a lot of things. We go gradual, like, oh, you know, you have this uh, chronic condition or this illness that is with you, and every day you might have to take some medication then it starts preempting and prompting the child about such condition until such time that the child will even ask mommy or daddy what is this condition you've been talking about then you introduce the topic gradually the Ghana AIDS Commission says disclosure of HIV status in sub-Saharan Africa is very low and Ghana is not an exception. Disclosure is, 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 is low because of stigma and discrimination. People are still saying that uh, it is it's, it's a moral fault. That's why people have HIV. Indeed, we know that the prevalence is high in sex workers. And in fact, we have even reduced that from about 11% to 4.7% uh, recently. In 2018, the data shows that it's come down even in sex works to that level. But it is not the only way one gets infected. You can even have a single sex act and you get infected with a positive person and you get Infected. Many children, after knowing their status, are unable to manage the emotional trauma. This is where caregivers and guardians must be educated in managing the psychological needs after disclosure. You need to assure them that when you get HIV, it's not a death sentence. People have HIV and they live to their fullness. Whatever age they are supposed to have, they do leave it before they pass on. You look for mentors for them, people who are also having HIV and they are taking their medication. Though HIV is not curable, it's manageable. Because of the introduction of the antiretroviral therapy, the ART, yeah, and it helps when you do this, 
you take your medication on time and you take it as the doctor has prescribed. It decreases the progression of the viral load and it helps you, it increases that of your CD4. So you are able to fight infections and the rest. When a, a child becomes very active, when it comes to its reproductive development, you know, some of this information must be known to the child. Or when the child is capable of expressing his or her opinion on matters and have a full understanding to appreciate certain information, the child must be uh, informed about the state. It's, it's something that is very important because it gives information to the child. It makes the child aware of his or her status. Every child has the right to health care, education and freedom of association and these rights are applicable to children living with HIV. However, the hard truth is that the rights of children living with HIV are often infringed upon. Uh, on the basis of their presence in there, that we design programs and activities to deal with them. And in doing that, we cannot deny them their right to education, good health, and also participation. So once we cannot deny them all this, then the state must put in measures, especially when it comes to health issues. Uh, the health of a child must be a paramount interest to the, to the state and see how better the state can protect that. So for me, if there's anything at all we want the state to do in terms of uh, providing certain solutions, is to make sure that the state of children living with HIV AIDS is at a certain level that they can attend school and then they can also have engagement with other children. In Ghana, there are a number of policies that address issues of vulnerabilities and these include children living with HIV. Child rights activists say children with special needs like HIV must be part of the entire social safety net. If the child is infected with uh, HIV AIDS, all the, the mechanism that exists within our social protection system must come to the aid of the child. So health is very, very important and that alone cannot also deny the child the right to education. You know, we don't have a special it's an integrated system that we practice, so we don't have a special place for uh, children who uh, are infected with HIV AIDS to go. But within the general uh, educational system, they have a place in there. Uh, the only thing is that you also need to protect other children in a manner that will not raise issue of a stigma or that will not have a reputational issues with the child and all. So those are the things. So, the, the entry point of enjoying the right of children who have been infected by HIV has to do with how do the state maintain their health. The alternative policies are, are that um, children infected with HIV must be given protection. The increasing number of cases with regards to children living with HIV is a worry to many. They say to successfully protect these children and ensure their cases are reduced to the barest minimum, religious bodies, civil society organizations and traditional authorities have a role to play. It is not just the Ghana AIDS Commission that has the responsibility. We all have the responsibility. And I keep saying that if one child gets infected with HIV, what is the guarantee that you are not opening the door for another child to also be infected? So we need to protect these children, these little ones, and help them. We must get ourselves informed. There must be committees in the churches, various committees that understand this thing. And, and that's why when it comes to churches, I always say we should not leave out the professionals, the paramedics, the nurses, the doctors, the midwives, and the, and, and the pharmacists, the scientists, the biologists, all of them are needed to be able to carve in that environment where we can help the little ones. And for me, it's very important. If we don't help them, we are breaking the growth of the church. I'm not sure even whether the majority of parents or the most people within the Muslim community are well informed about the rate at which children are getting infected. Within the Muslim community, uh, we live in a very close um, asso association. The polygamous families situation also there. So these ones are all 
means by which we accelerate the rate at which infection um, takes place. Um, children are using sharp implements. They are cutting. We know in our communities where um, the wanzam or those who uh, do, uh, do local cutting of fingernails and, and those things are all prevailing in our societies. And if children are open to these risks, then definitely we can see. So I think this information must come strong to the Muslim community so that um, we can use it as a basis to educate the society. The mention of HIV and AIDS brings to the fore the devastation of stigma from all spheres. Stigma is a Herculean problem in many countries, including Ghana. Stakeholders in the sector say majority of the populace are not adequately informed about the changing face of HIV and AIDS and hence the stigma attached to it. Sector advocates are therefore calling on partners to address the issue of stigma, especially with regards to children. It's bad to stigmatize. I always say that if you point one finger at me, the rest is pointing at you. And amazingly, those who stigmatize even don't know their status. They don't know their status. Even if you know your status and it's negative, does that give you any order to bring somebody down? No. Once a child is infected with HIV and is detected early, there are remedies that can also make the life to the child to live for forever up to the age that the child wants to. So it's not an uh, issue that we should just say that because you have HIV, yes, that's the end of your life. When children are stigmatized and you don't take it, it can lead to loneliness. And when loneliness sets in, it really affects the children. They isolate themselves from people and it can also lead to social isolation, which also will not help the child. The child wouldn't be able to mingle with other children. And if you don't take care, this can also lead to suicidal thoughts. Under the HIV and AIDS Act, stigmatization is an offense and punishable by law. Stigma is an offense if I know that you stigmatize me. Now the law has come through parliament, through the Ghana AIDS Commission, and to person with HIV that you can pick the person on. So I'm encouraging my friends who live with HIV that, hey, don't go and hide, come out, and let's pick that person on. We need to remove stigma in our societies, in our schools, in our workplaces. Because if there is no stigma in, uh, in our schools, and we all understand that we, won't, we don't need to stigmatize, all these other problems will be mute. We need to educate our community more to understand that once somebody gets infected, it doesn't mean that he is an evil person, an immoral person. We can get close, we show compassion. We use the principles of compassion, love, respect for the human dignity to treat all those who have been infected. Over the years, advocacy on mother-to-child transmission on HIV, AIDS and its related infections no longer exist. The rigorous campaign and educational programs designed to help reduce the spread is not visible. Many unborn children stand the risk of being infected. The question is, are we out of the woods yet? Government has a, a lot of work to do to educate the population. And it looks like HIV education has drastically gone down. You don't even you walk through the city of Accra, you don't even see a single signboard about HIV. And this is not a good one. So the people in the city do not know anything. In fact, there are many people who do not even believe that the HIV still exists. So in my view, let's continue with the education, uh, present the pictures, uh, and present the information make people feel that we still are living under threat and the various channels of infection are still do exist and infection still prevails. The Ghana AIDS Commission says mother-to-child transmission can be eliminated. With the current interventions, the use of the protocols, the guidelines for prevention of mother-to-child transmission, starting from all pregnant women offering themselves to be tested for HIV. This can reduce to less than 5% or even zero. We're getting just about 5% who are getting transmission from their mothers. And those people are those 
who do not come to Antinita or who are not on the medication and we don't know their status. So you will notice that it is necessary for us to have supervised delivery. All pregnant women should come to the clinic. It is a known fact that government cannot reduce or stamp out the menace alone. In time past, non-governmental organizations and other civil society groups were actively involved in the fight against the spread. Unfortunately, this effort has stalled. I don't think that the NGOs have stopped working on HIV issues. Uh, probably it is the approach that has changed. We, we had a lot of uh, education going on about HIV AIDS. and now if you enter every village, every community, one way or the other, they've heard of HIV AIDS and all that. So now it is, it is for us to look at how do we maintain the state of our children, you know, or people living with HIV. We do outreaches into communities, especially. Um, currently, we are based in uh, Ayin Swanwe district. The whole district we've adopted it. We are, uh, we've been partnered with uh, the social welfare department of the district, and uh, we are I'm part of the HIV oversight committee board in the district. So what we do is to move into the communities because it will surprise you. Most people still doubt if there is still HIV or AIDS. The issue of funding for children living with HIV remains a challenge, though some money is allocated to cater for the needs of these vulnerable children, it is still inadequate. Feeding 58 children three times a day, paying fees, and amazingly, these are all in private schools. All the two are investing from this home, the home take care of them. Caregivers for these children are often left to carry the weight of providing shelter, food and educational needs alone. Barely any funding comes from government. We are hoping that very soon there will be an AIDS fund that is being spearheaded by the Ghana AIDS Commission, which is under the office of the president. As a program manager in the program, we're going to make a case for areas like that because they are vulnerable. Sometimes taking care of their food and all that is the responsibility of those private groups. If you decide to go into that, my experience having visited some of them is that it's their wahala. In dealing with children living with HIV, the experts believe engaging with other stakeholders for properly defined guidelines and support for these vulnerable children is extremely important. They propose the strengthening of the Ghana AIDS Commission and the establishment of a clearly defined fund. There are pocket of policies. For instance, when you are a pregnant woman and go to the hospital, one of the now the requirement is that you need to test for HIV AIDS and hepatitis B before they come, if you have it, then they will put you on treatment so that the consequences will not be on the child and all that. So these are some entry policies, but there are policies that must also address issues of child protection. AIDS Commission alone cannot do the work. Other organizations are also helping. UN, they are all helping to champion the campaign. But it looks like it is still not enough. The simplicity manner in which we present the message is what will help the man at Choco, the man at Mokola, the man at Mamubi or Nima, the man at Kaswa to understand that HIV is say idea, a best say we do this way. We have a table. We have a table. We have a table. Health experts say local production of antiretroviral drugs is the way to go. They believe this will reduce the shortage of the drug in the various hospitals across the country. One of the solutions that is critical is local production of antiretroviral drugs. Producing them right in our country. There have been quite uh, a number of discussions, collaborations, and attempts to ensure that we are able to produce enough to cover the whole country. Again, on that, on that score too, there are some challenges, all right, but the talk is ongoing and we will not stop. Once we have the expertise here, Dan Adams, 
have tried, other countries are buying it, the, they have tested it, it's just to get a certain lances. I believe government should support so that that lances to be given, so that the number of days these medicines spend from overseas before it reach our shores. Because some of, some of the shortages are because the medicine has not arrived yet. International bodies like the World Health Organization and UNICEF are passionate about child-related issues, and this includes children living with HIV. The UNICEF interventions, they make sure that HIV care is prioritized. So uh, UNICEF is currently supporting point of care for HIV testing among children, early infant diagnosis. UNICEF supports some initiatives to make sure that we enhance mother-to-child transmission, elimination of that. UNICEF is supporting some mental mother programs. Whoever hear our voice, where you are a pharmaceutical company, come to our aid with medicines to support. You want to take care of our school fees, our textbook, our school uniform, will be great. In terms of education, teachers and heads of schools are being entreated to protect the integrity, secrecy and dignity of every child living with HIV. Since there are no designated schools for these children, teachers must be educated to treat them with the needed care. Not all teachers excuse me, have the background education on HIV. So our children, we don't disclose their status to them, to, to their teachers, no. Because the stigma is there. We have done one before, it backfired. The whole school got to know. So you are a teacher, concentrate on teaching. The children, most of them are on medication. And medication is treatment. With the teachers, it was unfortunate that thing happened, that a teacher went out stigmatizing a child is not good. But we have people who support, the adherence support. Such a person will keep it as a secret. We need to be counseling such people to know that HIV is not a death sentence. Issues in relation to how teachers must conduct themselves. Is there a professional uh, uh, behavior that you need to protect the secrecy and maintain the dignity of a child? So if a teacher goes around to public issues relating to the welfare of the state of a child, then that person is not fit to be a teacher at all. Here is a word of caution to all. All of us in society, from the caregivers to the general population, and it can only happen if they know. So education. We need money for prevention education. You see, information on HIV should be routine. We preach abstinence, we preach, uh, I mean, like, uh, being faithful and all the others, uh, no sex before marriage. But the realities and the data are showing that even the youth are sexually active. If you are not married, just take your time, abstain. That is the most, I mean, surest way. If you cannot abstain, then, um, go the condom way. Christian leaders, Christian pastors, counselors, congregation, deacons, deaconess, leaders, let us get ourselves properly informed about HIV and we can help ourselves and help others. And don't forget the God factor. The Muslim community should stop to eschew stigmatization, they must eschew discrimination and cooperate with the Ghana Health Service and the AIDS Commission. To our young people, hey, there is HIV, so play it wise. And we always go by the ABC approach. The abstinence is very key, the abstinence. Marriage couples, number two, B, be faithful to each other. If you cannot abstain, you cannot be faithful. The C is there, that is, then use condom. Augustina Ampofo and Brian Echampon have a wish. For me, I wouldn't say personally my wish. I want a wish for especially those who are living with HIV. They need educational support. Especially children who are HIV positive and they are orphans. 
they have dreams, they have aspirations, but the question is whom is going to support them. So I wish that the government will identify those children in our society and help them. Like they should give them the support to be able to go to school, if it's schooling, if it's training, anything they want to do, the support should be there to be able to help them to acquire them because they're also human beings like us. And also, one thing I wish for is that in Ghana, sometimes I sit back and cry. I realize that the education in Ghana is very, 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 very poor. People up to now, people think that when I hug you, when I shake you, I'm going to get the virus. And it is killing us. Those who are living with HIV positive. The virus doesn't kill us because we know we have to take our drugs and feel strong. But when you stigmatize us, we feel very, very low self-esteem. We, we, we feel like we are not part of human beings. I wish the government to uh, educate those who are positive and put stop to stigmatization because it is destroying the country. A humanitarian and civil rights leader, Mahatma Gandhi, says the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its vulnerable members. The above quote holds true. Children living with HIV are as healthy as other children. Today, it is the case of Augustina Ampofo and Brian Echampon who represents the hard truth, neglects and woes of the many children living with HIV in Ghana. Flip the script and it could be you, your child or a family member. All children and adolescents living with HIV are fighting for its inclusion and not to be ostracized by society in reducing HIV cases and providing the needs of children living with HIV, religious leaders, health experts, NGOs and civil society groups are calling for a collective approach in handling HIV and AIDS cases, especially amongst children. Partners are calling for routine information sharing on HIV at the national, regional, districts and community levels.